Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. I'm Rich Lyons, Dean here at Berkeley's Haas School. I'm, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you today and for all of us to get to, to hear speak here one of our own alumna from UC Berkeley. It's Ann Baker, as you know. Her topic today is my unexpected leadership journey. So Anne graduated from UC Berkeley with a BA in political science and, and also rhetoric. She went on to pursue a career in investment banking. She was focusing on technology startups. Eight years into her career with Montgomery Securities, she found herself faced with an unexpected and difficult career decision and life decision, and one that would have a profound impact on the leader she is today. Anne currently serves as president and CEO of Telecare Corporation, a role she stepped into after the unexpected death of her father in 1987. In this role, she has responsibility for the strategic, clinical, and financial operations of the company. For those of you not familiar with Telecare, it's an inpatient and outpatient mental health service provider offering a full range of services and supports to individuals with mental illness and complex needs. They operate in eight states, serve over 29,000 clients each year. Her arrival, since her arrival at Telecare, the organization has grown from 400 employees in Northern California to over 3,000 employees. She's an exemplar of a values-based leader. She's passionate about the work she does and the significant impact it has on bettering people's lives. She's also someone who goes beyond her role as CEO to give back to her community and also to her field. She has received formal commendations from U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein and former State Senate Pro Tem Don Parada. She was honored by the Iris Alliance, also Tipper Gore, Gore also Girls Inc., for her many contributions to the mental health care field. In an interview with SF Business Times 2013, among other topics, Anne was asked, what is your biggest pet peeve? Her response, people who don't really say what they think. Give me the straight scoop and please don't hold back. This is truly an authentic leader. There's a lot we can learn from her. It's our, my honor to welcome and please join me, Ann Baker. Thank you so much. Thank you. So can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. So it's really a thrill to be here. I can't tell you, Dean Lyons, thank you so much for welcoming me. Thank you all uh, for being here today. As a former graduate of UC Berkeley, as you heard, um, with a family that actually has quite a legacy here um, on campus, um, it's really just a thrill to be here. So thank you for your presence and for your interest um, in my 30-year journey, really leading this organization through many, many changes in healthcare. I'm also sort of at a stage in my life <laughs> where I think the, uh, the, the prospect of teaching is something that I find really rewarding, teaching and learning. And so I hope as we go along today, um, you'll feel free at the, at the right points to engage in some conversation with me and some questions about what I have to say. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So, um, the Dean Lyons sort of gave you a little bit of background, but I thought I'd, again, just go through a few of the key points about who Telecare is, where we've been. Uh, we're a $300 million organization with a 51-year history of providing outstanding behavioral health services to individuals with complex needs. Um, so we just celebrated our 50th milestone, which um, really was an important milestone for us. We took a look at where we've been, we really celebrated, and now I like to say we're building for the next 50 years. Um, we provide services primarily in partnership with public um, entities, state and county governments in California, Washington, and Oregon. Um, but we also have very significant relationships with commercial health plans such as Kaiser here in the Bay Area um, and United Healthcare. We have a very broad spectrum of services. I would say that's one of the most unique things about us, both inpatient, acute hospital services, subacute, as well as a range of community-based services, including things like evidence-based assertive community treatment, crisis services, and residential services. We're also a very diverse workforce. We have 3,500 employees, and that ranges from a physician services group where we actually employ psychiatrists. Um, and nurse practitioners, as well as social workers, counselors, and in our inpatient programs, dietary workers and housekeepers. So very diverse workforce, both professionally and, of course, culturally. 
We um, are very unique also in the sense that we're a family employee owned organization. So we don't really exactly have the culture of a family business because 35% of our ownership is all of our employees. And we're not an institutionally owned, publicly traded um, organization. So we're really sort of like a hybrid, I like to say. We're very mission driven, but part of what we bring to our partners is an effectiveness, accountability, and innovativeness that you sometimes don't see um, in the not-for-profit community-based sector. We have a growth rate of roughly 8 to 10 percent over the last 30 years since I've been there, um, something that's uh, not quite as high as some of my internet friends, <laughs> but something we're quite proud of. And I would say that with the expansion of Medicaid and affordable care the last few years, that's actually ticked up more to the range of 12 to 15 percent, which we've been seeing the last few years. Now, of course, that might change, which I know is one of the questions you, you have to ask me about. So the scope of today's discussion, um, I was, I'm going to give you a little bit of more brief history. I'm going to try to focus on some of the critical factors that I think have contributed to my success and the organization's success. Um, and then I'd like to have some Q&A around that in terms of the Haas School pr principles that I was just telling um, Dean Lyons really personally resonated for me. I mean, I really think they fit in terms of how I've led, and I really commend the school for focusing on them. I think it's hard to grow as a leader if you have attitude <laughs> and you don't know what you don't know. So I think that that really is, um, is thoughtful. So in terms of beyond yourself, forever a student, confidence without attitude, and questioning the status quo. Okay. So. Um, as a starting point, I just wanted to make a distinction um, in terms of how folks come, how you might come to the work of developing your own business or joining an organization going forward. And in my mind, there's kind of an important differentiation that I'd like to make in terms of talking about my experience because it's really aligned more with one than the other. Um, I think many people get started in a business, especially since we live in Silicon Valley, where day one you're thinking about, I'm going to fill this need and what's my exit strategy, <laughs> you know? I have a friend the other day who's a very successful real estate developer. I said, what motivated you? He said, greed. <laughs> you know, he knew it. Okay, that's good. You know, he's been very successful, right? Um, so they know what their exit strategy is. There's a need they're going to try to fill and they have a time horizon in which they're going to get out because they get a higher return on investment. So I learned that when I was in Montgomery Securities. I think other people like myself really approach uh, their business uh, with a broader sense of purpose and passion around wanting to have a social impact. And so they want to build a successful enterprise, but there's really something bigger than that in terms of their purpose that really fuels their energy and the way they think about how they operationalize their values and goals as an organization. That's the approach that I've taken. That's the approach that I'm going to talk about today. I think both approaches can be successful, um, but the one I feel most um, qualified to speak about is the latter. And it was really uh, rooted in um, a deep passion to improve the state of the art of behavioral health services in this country, um, in the communities where we serve, where we also feel we make system-wide contributions as well. So. Little did I know, right? <laughs> that is me on the far right side. My staff love it when I show them this picture. Um, so I was at the ribbon cutting of the very first facility back in 1965, Gladman Memorial Hospital, which was the first freestanding psychiatric hospital um, in Northern California at the time. My dad was one of three partners. He was the business partner with an, a psychiatrist. That's my dad on the far left. Um, Art Gladman was the psychiatrist in the partnership to his left. The woman who was kind of the 60s beehive was Lida Hahn. She was a nurse, um, and that was me. And the guy in the middle, we don't know who he, he was, but we're convinced he was the politician because you got to let the politician cut the rim. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. So, um, a little bit more about the actors. So, Telecare um, in 1965 uh, was. Uh, owned equally among the three partners when it was founded. And I would say that they actually, at the very beginning, shared, even though they had very different personalities, um, a common vision around wanting to change the state of the art of psychiatric hospital care. So that vision included from the environment. They, uh, my dad had a student of Frank Lloyd Wright design the building. It was a standalone facility. There was a Chronicle article that said, this is a hospital, because it felt much more homelike. Um, that what existed at the time. So it extended from the milieu, the environment, to the treatment approach, which was very individualized. It was in a freestanding environment, not in a large medical surgical setting like Alta Bates. So there was a more individualized treatment approach, and there was more of what was called a therapeutic milieu at that time, a sort of uh, sense that the culture and the family feeling was really critical to the outcomes with the patients. So they had this this vision that really was shared among them. 
um, in terms of the development of the hospital. My dad actually, interestingly, became kind of the guiding light as an operating leader until he died in 1987. So even though he was the business partner and he thought the clinical leadership was going to take the helm, it did work out that he actually became the operating leader. So what about me? I was the youngest of three girls in a family of five. I often say if my father had had a boy, my life would have been very different for the women in the audience. <laughs> my dad had a little bit of chauvinism in him, but I think I was the boy that he never had in a certain way. So he really always encouraged me, and I had a very close relationship with him. And I would say even to this day, the memory of my dad still fuels a lot of my um, interest in, in my work. My dad had mental health in his family, which was part of what fueled him. And interestingly enough, I think because of my conversations with him at the dinner table over the years, both personally and professionally, I actually developed a kind of optimistic view of the potential of psychiatric interventions to make a difference in people's lives. It's interesting because I was telling uh, Dean, I was with Patrick Kennedy yesterday. I'm working with him on some awareness campaigns around stigma reduction. I told him the story. It was like, really? <laughs> that was pretty amazing because even today, of course, there's so much. Um, stigma around mental health, the idea that I actually grew up with an optimistic view around mental health and the potential of the clinical interventions, I think, is, is kind of telling. Um, however, I never in a million years thought I was going to go into the family business. I went to Berkeley. I was involved as in student advocate on the campus. I majored in political philosophy and rhetoric. I went back and earned my thesis writing about the bias in standardized tests in the rhetoric department and um, came back and went to work at a law firm, McCutcheon Doyle in San Francisco, I went until I was going to go to law school. I was waiting to go to law school. And I tell my son this. I have a 19-year-old son who's col at Columbia. Don't say boo, because I kind of like Columbia. No, <laughs> but you know, I tell him, because it's, the point is, you, know, you don't always know. I got a job at McCutcheon Doyle, and I really hated it. I was like, this is kind of boring. Um, it's so detail-oriented. It's not really what I want. So I took a leave of absence. I decided not to go to um, law school. I deferred. And instead, I said I want to learn about business. And um, in retrospect, I think maybe because I came from a family of entrepreneurs, really, and I somehow talked myself into a job working as a research assistant um, at Montgomery Securities writing some of the research reports. My rhetoric degree really helped me because I could write really, really well. Knowing how to write well, I think, is underestimated. Um, and then I ended up loving it. And I became a research analyst. And then I became part of a small venture group um, that was involved in um, technology investments on microsystems. I wrote a report called the Database Derby about Oracle. Um, uh, got to meet Bill Gates from Microsoft. Really loved what I was doing and was feeling, as a woman, I think, really empowered in terms of my effectiveness making investments. Um, so I think, actually, it's interesting that Again, those, you never know how things are going to shape your future. But I think my confidence as a businesswoman was really critical um, to my ultimate decision. OK. The plot thickens. Um, so there I am. And my father is taken uh, to get a treatment. And uh, July 15, 1987, he has an adverse reaction, and he dies unexpectedly. He's 64 years old. I'm the youngest of three girls, but I'm named as the trustee. Um, in the estate. My mother had died uh, several years before. Um, and I realized that there are options that were triggered upon his death to buy out his partners, especially since he was, had been the operating leader um, for so long. Um, I said that I was going to, and I did, take a leave of absence <laughs> from Montgomery Securities and study the situation. Um, so when I studied the situation, um, the interesting thing is I always say, if I had really just studied it, I never would have done it. <laughs> because uh, 23 million, about 15 uh, million of it was Gladman Hospital, and it was about to go off a cliff. You had deregulation, large publicly traded psychiatric hospitals coming into the field, like Psychiatric Institutes of America, billion dollar company, PIA, part of NME, a uh, billion dollar company, um, what was the other one, First Hospital, that was a, you know, Ron Distorts, these gigantic companies, and then at the same time, um, reimbursement going down because you had managed care coming in and suddenly 28-day detox inpatient programs were no longer good. So you had revenues going down, reimbursement going down, not a pretty picture. Okay, so I thought I'd pause here. You know the decision I made, obviously. We don't have to guess about that. So one of my questions was, why do you think I did it? And why would, what would you do? What do you think you would do if presented in this situation? I guess one other piece of information that I would say that's important is that the, there was 14 million 
that was Gladman, but then there was another nine million that was this thing that was a public-private partnership that had been established to provide um, alternative services for people who were coming out of the state hospital. So, th so the picture was that there was this flagship that was about to go down, and then there was this other Alameda County-based public-private partnership serving people with more serious illnesses who had dropped off of their private insurance. So, so I'm just curious, I don't know if that's that relevant, but I just sort of, I'm curious, like why do you think I made that decision? Correct. Well, and then what was the first part? Uh, because you provide a critical service. Critical service, yes. Yes, and my relationship with my father, yes. Others? Yep. interesting question because there was a business analysis, both subconsciously and later, later consciously. I mean, the company was valued at the time at six million dollars, and if I hadn't bought out the partners, we only owned a third. Um, and so there was a feeling that I had that um, if I sold out, it probably was selling cheap. Um, because I thought there was more potential, even though I saw the problems, and there were tax implications. So there also was a business calculation that, that I made um, around what I thought it was worth and felt like I would be selling on the cheap, basically, if I, if I went that direction. So that's a really good point. Yep? I think your buyer was an emotional um, decision, too. That yeah. So it's interesting because the motivation question and the passion question is so key, right? You know, and I, I sometimes think it's overstated. I say to my son, well, you need to do what you're passionate about. And it sort of assumes people know what they're passionate about. You don't, knowing what you're passionate about is not necessarily <laughs> the easiest thing to know. But I would say the passion that I have around this is, is still some of the same passion. I feel like we are serving a really essential need that nobody else is serving with the authenticity and commitment and capability that we are, which sounds arrogant, but I feel that way. I feel like my dad and I were very close, and I do feel like I'm kind of keeping him alive in memory and spirit by continuing to build this legacy in honor of him. And I feel like I am a really motivated and pretty capable businesswoman. So I also love the fact that I am growing a very successful, mission-driven, high-integrity company. So I would say even today, this is historical 30 years, but I would say even today, those are still the things that fuel me at, and I was telling Dean Lines, I'll get there later, at another time where we're at a critical crossroads in healthcare, right? Critical crossroads, Medicaid as we know it may go away. So still important to tap into what your faith and what your passion is. Uh-oh. Okay, so fast forward 31 years, I'm gonna do a snapshot. I kinda like this picture because, um, you know, we're kinda navigating the waters, and I think of that ship over there as all those big companies that were telling me I didn't know what I was doing when I was 29 years old, <laughs> and they're not around anymore, so I always feel like, well, we must be doing something right, right? So we've navigated a lot, and that's a great source of confidence. Um, also, that over 31 years, I've seen some very big, more powerful, better capitalized companies come and go as we have sort of slow and steady kept on, on track. Um, so the growth in individuals we've served has gone from roughly 15,000 a year to over 33,000 unique individuals each year. Uh, our growth in revenues and geography, in 1987 we were 20, 23 million, five programs, one state. Today we're 300 million, 90 programs, eight states, 32 counties, 45 different payers. Our ESOP is independently valued every year by an independent valuation area. It's a fiduciary plan, so it's, it's definitely independently, independent trustees, independent valuation, has more than doubled the S&P since the time it was created, roughly 11.3% to 4.8%. 
It's been my best investment. So, someone used the word secret sauce. How did we do it? So I'm going to have two slides here, and then we're going to open it up to some more questions. So how many of you know Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, Build to Last? Raise your hands kind of high so I know how many people. OK. So shortly after my dad died, you know, I knew a little bit about business, I felt. I knew a little bit about politics. I knew what I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know about leading 300 employees. And so one of the first things that I did that I think is emblematic of my style is I do traverse outward in a crisis rather than inward. And I would say that that's an interesting lesson. If there's something in a place I don't know, I know what I don't know, I get help. And I get help from people, and I learn from people. So Jim was an assistant lecturer at Stanford at the time, and he was teaching a class um, down at Stanford on the weekends. I don't even remember where I read about it, but I took the class, and I was really attracted to it, primarily because coming from Montgomery Securities, I knew I had this instinct about wanting to build something that was better than even what my father had done, stronger than what even my father, that was mission driven, but I thought that might be a little bit naive. Like I come from Montgomery Securities, right? Everything was about the numbers. I was like, God, is this kind of a naive view to think about this? And he was writing at the time about companies that were mission driven, that not only did well, they did better than the control group. Now, you know, we may argue about whether his research is good enough or whatever, but it certainly spoke to me. And so going and talking to him, and actually, he just spoke at our 50th anniversary, so he has been a long-term partner and, and real uh, teacher to me over the years, and his framework has really resonated for me. So I would say that the framework um, that he gave me, which really was a framework, is a framework that I continue to use and think about forever a student, because each of these ingredients that from him I learned, I, I believe, were gonna be critical to my success, I think are necessary but not sufficient. So if I had grown as a leader, but I didn't develop a culture that was grounded in values and purpose, I'm not sure I would have been as successful. If I had built a culture that was grounded in values and purpose, but I didn't develop a mission statement that moved us strategically in the market in new directions, I wouldn't have been successful. Or if I had developed a great mission statement, but I didn't grow as a leader, I don't think it would have worked. So in my mind, each of these components that I continue to think about today, forever a student, are really critical in terms of how I evolve the company. So in the early days, I would say, growing as a leader meant really professionalizing the operation. I just spoke at a, at a family business conference the other week, and I said, I didn't grow this company for my children. I do have two boys. Who knows? I'm not building this company for them. That was sort of a radical statement to make, right? I'm growing this company because I want to grow this company for a purpose, and if they have the special skills and interests down the road, maybe they will come in. So I pulled in a professional leadership team. What existed before was more, you know, the dietary worker would cook meals for us on the weekend or for Art Gladman or the housekeeper would. It was really more of a traditional family business where the focus was on knowing the owners and the relationship with the owners. So a big part of the work in the beginning was having the courage to have conversations with those people and respectfully transition those people and bring in people who had more a professional image around a clinical vision, an operating vision that would, that would make a difference. That was sort of phase one. I had those leaders, most of them, for 20 years. And then about seven years ago, I looked around the table and they're all 10 years older than me, and I don't look that young, so you can figure this out, right? So I was like about, about seven years ago, oh my God, if this is gonna be a, a great company, I need to do this again. So the last several years, my work, my main work has been around bringing in leaders, someone who was a CFO at Optum, who really understood, uh, you know, if we're gonna go at risk in our reimbursement, how do we do that? I brought in a new medical director who has, was Sloan Kettering, whole health, integrating on average, you know, somebody with serious mental illness dies 30 to 40 years below the general population. So how do we integrate whole health into our model? So I revamped the team again to think about, well, how do we scale? What do we need for the next generation? And I'm continuing to. I just brought somebody on my board. I'm thrilled. If I think telecare could be a 600 million or a billion dollar company. So I just brought in a woman who was CEO of Bright Horizons. They have 30,000 employees. What am I going to learn from her? A lot, right? So this is something that I see as being an iterative process. You're always, how do you build your team? How do you scale? How do you grow? For me, it's bringing in people who I can grow from, who teach me how to scale, and I love that. I actually don't do it just because I have to. I really like to grow. It's just innate in my nature. 
Similarly, in the beginning, there, my dad was, and his partners were very quality oriented. Gladman was very, but they didn't have like a statement of values and beliefs. So in the beginning, my first iteration was declaring them. What do we stand for? We stand for respect. You can't have recovery if you don't have respect. And we have to show respect to each other, not just to our clients. Recovery. We have to believe that interventions make a difference. We have to believe that people here can improve and go on and create a great life. If we don't have staff who feel that, they're not a fit. Results. Counties and plans won't hire us unless we do it better. Better, more cost effective and higher quality. So results. So we have to have these very effective ways of working with partners to, to generate those results. So part of it in the beginning was declaring what do we stand for. And then the second iteration, which I could talk about, was having it blow up in my face and realize, guess what? Declaring it isn't enough. It's good. <laughs> but you can't just say respect and have respect, right? You know? It's, I always say, it just takes one Elvian nurse on a night shift to create a revolution. <laughs> OK. Evolving our mission to stimulate progress. The first iteration was revolutionize institutional mental health care in the state of California, firmly planting ourselves in the public sector and saying, this Gladman thing, it's good, but we're going to grow in the public sector, revolutionizing institutional mental health care, helping to move people out of state hospitals, create community support so they can regain their health hopes and dreams. That was iteration one. Public sector reimbursement for inpatients started to go away. Not just on the commercial side, but in the, on the other side. The administration of Schwarzenegger and Bush was really downsizing Medicaid, which is where we may go back. We said, well, we need to develop community-based services. So develop services and systems of care. We grew dramatically in assertive community treatment, crisis services, community-based services. It's half of what we do now. And then we just got done doing a, mission a new mission statement. which we, So again. You don't just do it and stop. <laughs> you got to keep doing it. Each of these pieces, and I believe that if I hadn't done each of them along the way, I wouldn't have been able to do what we've done. Okay. So I guess I could open it up, but this is a little more drilling down into each of these areas. I was going to try to um, point out some of the kind of yin and yang in here. Leading yourself, you have to have faith in your core, pur core, pur uh, core purpose, but a disciplined framework. Now, that is very relevant to me today. Am I scared about what's happening at a federal level? I met with Patrick Kennedy yesterday. He believes it's going to happen. Patrick Kennedy knows a lot. He says he thinks Medicaid is going to get block ran in. It's going to be terrible. He's planning for four years out. So, so my faith is the need for behavioral health and substance use services in this country are greater than they have ever been. It is tearing at the social fabric everywhere. Opiate addiction. Teenage suicide, incarceration in jails, homelessness, the medical cost offset if you provide med behavioral health treatment. How many people, I'm talking with Kaiser at the highest levels now, how many people that, they that are the most expensive, they have back pain, you know, or they don't go see their doctor? It's people that have a lot of times chronic illnesses that are depressed and not treating the underlying mental illness has a huge impact on our health care system. So I have faith that we're needed. And I need to be disciplined about how I navigate this, this time, but I have faith and it's really helping to carry me through. Because even though I realize we may have to hunker down, we have low debt. This is one of my other principles. Hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst, right? I said that the other day, that you know, we may have to really cut back. If, we, you know, if this thing goes the one way it would, we have to be prepared for the worst. And I'm also being disciplined in our new mission statement about thinking about how we can move in new directions that are going to be funded differently. Population health, which is funded by commercial plans. Justice-involved mental health that is going to be funded by the downsizing of the prisons. MIDD, the combat dual diagnosis of people with intellectual disabilities and behaviors, is a different system with different funds. And we're sort of gradually discipline, piloting, going in this direction. So hopefully we have time if the other thing falls out. So faith, I'm not just sitting around saying, I have faith, right? You know, I'm moving very fast to think about what's our debt structure, what's the worst case financially, could we withstand it, and how are we moving in a new direction that might 
not just mitigate the, the damage, but really to help us to continue to grow. In fact, we actually have a current three-year plan, I keep looking at it on my bad days, um, that assumes that for the next three years, we're gonna grow 8% a year, which I would think was, would be pretty good, given what the prospect is since Medicaid is such a core course of our, of our uh, revenue. So I don't know if any one of these others you guys wanna talk more about. Um, you know, there were some critical decisions along the way. Um, I say your legacy will not be defined by what you say, but what you choose to do in the clutch. So my sisters wanted liquidity. A critical decision was how I capitalized the company to create that liquidity. Um, there was pressure at the time to go public, to bring in private equity. Being a sort of forever, <laughs> you know, invest forever kind of orientation, enduring and great, bringing in an, an institution or an equity investor would have really changed the trajectory of the company, we would have had to have an exit strategy. So the ESOP, which I fought very hard for, was really sort of the, the best solution. It aligns our employees, who are, who are mission-driven also. It provided inexpensive liquidity um, to the family. Um, and it continues to be a really good, a good strategy for us. So that would be a good example of a critical decision defines the future of the company. There are critical decisions like that. I had, of our 3,400 employees, we have roughly 250 that are SEIU organized. We've had some very, very, very challenging negotiations with SEIU. Um, really ones that were like, I couldn't agree to changing the work rules. I mean, it wasn't even a matter of finance. We provide 24 seven whatever it takes availability for our folks. Um, Bruce Wolpert, I don't know if you know Bruce Wolpert, he's a friend of mine, he's from Granite, he got the Malcolm Baldridge Award three times in a row from uh, Granite Connection, and I, I called him, I was like, what do I do, you know, <laughs> and he's like, you just can't, you know, he gave me coffee, you just can't, you, it's so, the soul of the company, this is really about the soul of the company, Anne. and, you know, even if you're a, two, a third smaller, you know, you'll, you'll, re you'll re be able to repair that, if you sell your soul, you can't recover. And it was like that I came in the next day, it was easy. Guess what? No, forget it. Not, not doing it, you can have the business back. Not doing it. Big decision. You want some more? Or you want to ask some questions? Yeah, please, have a, you can the microphone up, and if you yeah. have questions, go for it, right? Um, could I ask one question of as course. people are coming to the microphone? Yeah. Um, w w so the industry is one that most people would look at as lots of ambiguity, and your, your slice within it is, yeah. is even more ambiguity. So right. when you think about managing an ambiguity and experimentation, yeah. I know these are, could you say more about that? Well, I think one of the qualities, I was just sort of picturing my son while I was saying, it's hard. One of the qualities of being an effective la leader is having the tolerance for ambiguity and being able to act in ambiguity. So, you know, I, I was telling you earlier, in the beginning, did I know I was gonna be able to save the company? No, but I decided I was going to focus on doing something. I learned a framework, I brought in different people, I thought I could reposition this company in the public sector and have a growth path, and I thought, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, what's the worst case scenario? I could always go back, right? And I'll see. It wasn't like I had this sort of like the sky opened and suddenly I realized that I was going to have a $300 million company. I said, go, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> We're going to read the story. Anyway, I could just, I'm thinking, you know, do, do, do something that's smart. Think about bringing in new leaders. Think about declaring your values. Think about positioning, you know, talking to customers about how you grow this product line. And then see. And it's kind of what we're doing right now. I mean, this is really, it's a timely presentation. We have four new service lines. Our new mission statement is deliver excellent and effective. Effective signaling that behavioral health has to be more outcome oriented. Excellent and effective behavioral health services to engage individuals with complex needs in recovering their health, their hopes, and their dreams. And that statement, there's a lot of words that you might not get, but effective is key. Um, engagement, we talk a lot about, there isn't an algorithm that will help people that we serve. It's a lot about the engagement and the trust and the relationship that's the interven intervention. And health, hopes, and dreams is about integrating um, health. But we have four, it's basically the big picture is about serving new broader populations. So broader populations who have co-occurring substance use treatment, broader populations that have health uh, problems, broader populations that have justice involvement, 
broader populations that have intellectual disabilities, and right now, we're doing pilots in every single one of those. So we just were named by Santa Clara County, we just got a contract to do the first Behavioral Health National Pay for Success program. It's being, um, it's being uh, studied with Stanford. And the idea is that through this model that we're developing, we're going to be reducing the behavioral health and the physical health costs of these very high-risk users, and that's going to pay for the program. So the idea is it's a social impact program that, that focuses on not just reducing the behavioral health outcomes for people and the behavioral health cost, but also looking at the associated physical health cost. And the assumption is that we are going to pay for the service if you look at the system-wide cost. I mean, it's one of the interesting things about the Medicaid bill right now. The CBO just came out with this, and they're looking at the savings from cutting Medicaid, but they're not looking at the social costs associated with cutting all these people off, incarceration, hospitalization, you know, homelessness, that, you know, the, the social impact of cuts. Um, you know, could say, well, we're not going to spend as much on Medicaid, but where do these people go? <laughs> they don't go away, right? So did I answer your question? Yes, you okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank uh, you. Thank you for sharing with us. My name is Andre. I wanted to ask you, uh, throughout your career, how did you uh, find mentors for yourself? Mm -hmm. How did you cultivate uh, like mentors if you, uh, I believe you had yeah. several, many. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I think that's a really good question. Um, I'm fearless about seeking out mentors. You know, it's sort of like, I didn't know Jim Collins was going to become the guru <laughs> that he's become, but I had to have a little chutzpah, right, to like, you know, go and see him and say, gee, you need to come consult with me and you need to, you know, so um, I think that part of it was just, you know, and right now I'm courting Patrick Kennedy and had lunch with Patrick Kennedy yesterday. He's going to be a great, and I'm going to help him too because he needs some help in thinking about, um, he's trying to do a narrative of the civil rights issue of mental health, and I can help him with fundraising related to that. So, and Jim would say if he was here, you're a really good student, Anne. He would say, I've liked staying in touch with you all these years because you actually really take what I tell you and you try to grow with it. And that isn't always true. Teachers like good students. So, um, so I think part of it is the way I respond to people that I reach out to, um, and part of it is courage. It takes confidence to reach out to somebody. And then part of it is just being really resourceful. Um, I would say that the current board that I have, that Mary Antosio was someone who um, I came across through uh, the ESOP Association, and I called her up, and I invited her out, and I had her come speak, and she got to know us, um, and really liked us, because she's, you know, her passion is low-wage workforce and how you empower them and engage them, so we really fit for her, um, because we're a good test case pilot site for her. Um, who are some of the other mentors that I'm trying to tell you of recent cases and, and previous? There's a woman on my board named Joan Mizell, who um, is a PhD psychologist from Stanford, um, uh, did all the outcome studies. She's an MBA from Stanford. And how come I know so many people from Stanford? I need to get more involved. <laughs> no, but she has a PhD in clinical psychology and an MBA, and she worked for the state on doing, helped the state do all their outcome uh, evaluation. And then she worked for Howard Berman as his chief of staff. And she, you know, got engaged with me about 15 years ago and has been on my board. Um, and it's really helped. Oh, and she was at Lewin. She was at Lewin. So Jim helped me with my first mission statement. But I really realized that I needed somebody who knew the industry. I mean, I knew enough from my business background to know that this was really public mental health was, was sort of a specialty area. And so I knew I needed to find somebody. Alan Kittner was somebody that I knew from Montgomery as he was doing health care. I said, do you know anybody who really knows um, public mental health, and he directed me to Joan. So in some cases, it was sort of just having the, the guts to recruit somebody that I saw on TV, kind of, and in other cases, it was being resourceful about defining what I needed. This one, here's a good example. Those are examples of how I've succeeded. Let me give you an example, a recent one, of how I might have failed in doing this. Okay, my 20-year medical director who helped us develop our recovery center clinical system, which, I, which is the system we use to, to work with clients that is, has had a huge impact organizationally, retired. Um, and I started a search for a CMO. And I knew that 
it was sort of redefining what we needed because we needed to, we were actually decided we were going to bring in the physician com component to our operation as opposed to out. So we were going to create the, this physician services organization. So I knew I needed somebody who had more management, leadership, business, you know, skill. And I knew that given the trends in whole health, I needed somebody who had more experience with physical health, substance, substance use treatment. And I needed somebody that would be a fit on the team. So I went through a search, I did word of mouth. And there was somebody that somebody knew who they referred to me, but he didn't have quite the visibility. Um, and so I kept looking. Anyway, there was this guy who I came very close to hiring, who was like really well known in Magellan, really well known in the insurance industry, came out. He was even at our 50th. People really liked him. We kept taking him out to dinner, and he was really friendly. Uh, kept, you know, loved talking about uh, with me and with the group, how he was going to build our business. He got so excited. He was like, boy, would I, you know, if I could get Optum, you know, Blue Cross, these are the trends. I know I could really, I could really, we could do all of these things. Every time I talked to him. And then I had an offer out, sort of tentative offer. We were scheduled to talk the next day. I don't know, this isn't really a failure, actually. I, I need to find a better failure. It was almost, it was almost a failure. Literally, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was like, my instinct was, this guy had really good credentials. He seemed like he was a decent culture. But I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was like, I can't get him to talk about clinical issues. I can't get him to talk about the patient <laughs> and, you know, what he's done with patients. I just think maybe... It's he's too above it all, you know? And I need somebody who's going to be the champ. Who do I want my medical director to be? I want my med I don't want my medical director building my business. I have a business person. I'm a business person. I want my medical director to be the person who tells me how to do the work better and better and better and better and is excited about it, right? So needless to say, it was a near miss. I didn't hire him. And the guy that I hired is Probably, I mean, he might build our business more because he's so effective at helping us work through how you do integrated whole health and how, and he's passionate about it and he goes out in the field and when he talks, our whole field comes to life because people work at telecare because of the work. That is why they work at telecare. So that's a near miss. I have to find a better one where I really, I, I will, if somebody asked me for a mistake where I, you know, can be humble up here and tell you about how I really screwed up because I have. <laughs> here, yeah. Um, how did you earn the respect and confidence of your employees taking over as a 29-year-old woman? Uh -huh. And what were some of the challenges that you faced? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that day, for the first five years, I didn't expect anyone to... Um, I made a conscious decision that I did not expect anybody to believe that I could do it. And I could not look to anyone in the company for positive reinforcement. I expected them to respect my position and my authority. I didn't look to my staff for positive reinforcement. I didn't expect it. I expected people to believe that I didn't know what I was doing at age 29. Every reason not being in the field. But I expected them to respect my position and over time to gain confidence in me. So um, I would say that how I eventually did was by making good decisions along the way. And there was one person in particular who I really had to battle <laughs> because um, she used to just say to me, you know what, don't worry about it, I'm gonna take care of it. I know how, to, don't worry about it, Anne, we're gonna, we've got it figured out, don't worry about it. You know, I really know what I'm doing. And I didn't wanna lose her because I really felt like she didn't know a lot, but she was hiding things from me um, and she really wasn't, she was very threatened by me and so I had to, I had to let her go. So I would say, um, you know, I would say it was a similar thing with the, met the MD my father had at the time. There was a similar thing where, what are you telling, you know, you're not a clinician. Why, why are you asking me questions about our peer review system? Or why are you asking me questions about our clinical model, you know? Why, and so he ended up leaving because he felt I was disrespectful of him. I wasn't disrespectful of him, but he didn't believe that I had the credentials to question him. Yes. So hearing that you uh, wasn't expecting positive uh, reinforcement from your own team yeah, yeah. reminded me a close friend who said that the CEO job is a very lonely task. Yeah. I'd like to know whether you agree to that. And if yes, how did you uh, deal emotionally with it? Yeah. Um, I think it is a lonely job because when, when you're sort of like, you know, trying to figure out how to 
how to cross the ocean, <laughs> you know, um, it's, it, and you don't know the right path, it's lonely. Um, and, and it's only your decision. You, ha you know that the decision is yours. What, what has really, and I had a recent situation where we had a media problem I've never been in before, which was kind of, um, we had a, a media situation, and I've never been in that before. And so what really, really helps me is calling all help. <laughs> So I caught my media person in this thing. I got, you know, a politician involved that I trusted. I got my board. I called a board meeting. So everybody in the board was all hands on deck. Everybody knew what was going on. I lawyered up, you know, and my insurance company was saying, why are you hiring all these lawyers? One lawyer knows the attorney. He's the political guy. One no, no lawyer knows us. One lawyer is a strategist. And you know what? It's going to cost us less in the long run. Calling all help. I mean, that's a recent decision. I, and you know, if you ask my team, sometimes it drives them crazy, but I think that they have seen, I mean, if you just take that situation, the exposure. First of all, it helps me. I get to talk about it. I get to get other perspectives. I get ideas. And out of all of that, some people get overwhelmed. That's why I said I traverse outward versus inward. Some people traverse outward, and all that input would just make them feel overwhelmed. You know, my husband says, stop, stop asking. But for me, for me, calling all help, getting all the ideas, all the data. And that goes to this one. This is also my style. Um, where's the team? Building highly effective teams involves recognizing respectful disagreement is not the problem. It's core to the most effective solution. And that resonates for people at telecare because we have our treatment teams. And I'll say, on our treatment teams, if just the psychiatrist speaks and the social worker doesn't speak about the family history, what kind of results do you get? If the, if the voc rehab person doesn't talk about the importance of work, what kind of result do you get? If the team lead who sees the person every week doesn't speak up, what kind of result do you work? No. So in my team, I'm like, I want to hear from everybody. I want, we had a big debate the other day about how we use limited capital because we are, one of our challenges, we're, we don't have lots of capital. And my operations person was, we have got to get the electronic health record in everywhere. It is so critical to have these tools. We can, everything needs to go to that. And my development person was, if we don't get these new services and pilots off the ground, we're, we're going to have an electronic health record, but no business, you know? And afterwards, I thanked them both. I said, thank you. You were doing your job. I needed to hear from both of you. And if I didn't hear from both of you, I wouldn't have made the best decision. So. Loneliness is, you know, you're lonely, the decision is yours, but you don't have to be lonely in terms of the advice you get. You can go lots of places, and there's lots of people, people like to be asked for their advice, right? People love to be asked for their advice, their advice and counsel. I went to my, I mean, we work with boards of supervisors in the state, so I went to a couple of people at the state. The other thing that was good about it is they knew, so they weren't surprised. If this was gonna, if this was gonna come out in the media and be a negative media thing, they knew about it, because I had talked to them. So asking for help also gets people on your team. And we have, unfortunately, uh, no the, time. The, the, the 130 moment here. The, okay. I've taken a bunch of notes, and, and I can't summarize this. But you know, this, <laughs> this phrase, I love this phrase, I do traverse outward in a crisis rather than inward, right? We heard about that as a, as a method for success. Legacy not design, uh, defined by what you say, but by what you do in the clutch. And then maybe the most fundamental, you started here. What fuels you? And thank you very much. Well, thank you. This is so fun. Thank you. Thank you very much.